All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA task list series. Today we're starting G, behavior change procedures. We're getting into the heart of our task list here. Everything we've talked about up to this point, we're now going to use to actually change behavior, what we do for a living. And of course, we have to start with reinforcement. How are we going to strengthen behavior using positive and negative reinforcement? Now, you might think, I know everything there is to know about reinforcement. Why does this come up multiple times on the task list? It comes up multiple times because it's important. So we don't want to skip over items just because we perceive them as maybe more simple, but things we already know. Your job to be fluent in the entire task list, which means you need to study the whole task list. With that said, please subscribe if you haven't already. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for our study materials. When you pass, let us know. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. All right. Positive reinforcement. The most talked about principle in ABA, where we should always start. And it's very straightforward, right? When a behavior is followed by a reinforcing stimulus that was added, meaning positive, that behavior will increase, meaning reinforced, in frequency in the future. That's straightforward, right? Positive reinforcement, consequence, we add something, we give something, and then the behavior increases. That's positive reinforcement in a nutshell. Now, let's consider three qualifications. Let's dive a little deeper. One, the timing between the end of the behavior or the response and the reinforcer is very, very, very important. That contiguity is crucial. Immediacy is crucial. As little as five seconds between the response and the reinforcer can change the effectiveness of that reinforcement. So you want to deliver it immediately, especially when you're teaching a new behavior. Now, delayed consequences often involve rules and other complex social and verbal history, which we'll get into. But immediacy, super, super important. Two, the relationship between the stimulus conditions when the behavior occurred. When we think about SDs, discriminative stimuli, which we'll talk about, that relationship between the condition in which the behavior occurred and is then reinforced matters. And then finally, motivation or motivating operations. Very, very important in terms of establishing reinforcement and even abolishing reinforcement. So consider these three qualifications when deciding how to most effectively reinforce a learner's behavior. So what is the relationship between reinforcement and antecedent stimulus conditions. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because reinforcement changes the function of the antecedent stimuli that came before the reinforced responses. What does that mean? It means this is how SDs are created. When something occurs, let's say there is a chirping sound to the left, and let's say that's never happened before, but now you hear a chirping sound to your left, you turn your head and you look left, and what do you see when you see a colorful bird? What that's done is now change the function of hearing that chirping sound because now your behavior has been reinforced in the presence of that chirping sound to the left by turning your head left. We've now created a discriminative stimuli. That reinforcement consequence changed the function of that antecedent stimuli. So these antecedent events become SDs which evoke responses in a response class because responding in the presence of the stimulus produces reinforcement. This is how we start to gain control over behavior using our voice. When I say sit down to the learner the first time, they might run away. They might tell me no. They might not sit down. But if I say sit down and they sit down and then I deliver reinforcement, what have I done? I've started to create an SD where sit down now signals to the learner there's reinforcement available for sitting down. So reinforcement not only increases behavior, but it also changes the function, the purpose of these antecedent stimuli conditions, which is very important when we're changing behavior because we want to change the effects of antecedent conditions on our learners. And we can do that through reinforcement and by reinforcing in the presence of these antecedent stimuli. 
Now, negative reinforcement. First, negative reinforcement is not punishment. That is a huge misconception because growing up, most people have used negative reinforcement to imply something bad, right? Negative reinforcement is no different than positive reinforcement other than the consequence something is removed, something is avoided. It still is increasing behavior. The negative reinforcement occurs when the response terminates, escapes, or avoids a stimulus, which increases, very important, it's not punishment, still increasing that response in the future. In other words, think about negative reinforcement as avoidance or escape response. The response is occurring to avoid the presentation of the stimulus or escape or terminate a stimulus. And that response will be increased in the future. Very, very important. So four things to remember. Immediacy still matters. Same as positive reinforcement. The magnitude of the reinforcer is sufficient. So if your consequence, your negative reinforcement is a break, make sure that break is of a sufficient magnitude. The target response consistently escapes the voids, meaning reinforcement has to occur over and over again, especially when you're teaching a behavior. And then reinforcement is not available for other responses. We don't want other responses competing against the response that we're trying to reinforce. We're trying to make that response in that learner's repertoire increase. And if you've got a bunch of different responses leading to negative reinforcement, well, that's going to mess up your target behavior. So you want to make sure no other responses are competing for reinforcement. That's negative reinforcement. We're not going to overthink it. If the consequence involves escape, avoidance, or termination, and it increases the behavior, think negative reinforcement. Now, a couple more things to consider. Automaticity of reinforcement. That is when a learner does not need to know they're being reinforced for it to be effective. Meaning, regardless of whether you tell somebody they're receiving reinforcement or not, reinforcement can still be effective. Them knowing it does not affect that. Now, if you tell them they're going to receive reinforcement, then you're setting up contingencies, and that's a whole different thing. But regardless, even if they didn't know, if you are actually reinforcing the behavior, it doesn't matter that they don't know. That's what we call automaticity. Second, the arbitrariness of the behavior selected. And this is why the closeness, the immediacy is so important. Whatever response is followed by reinforcement is going to be the response that changes. So if you wait 10 seconds after a response to deliver a reinforcement, think of all the things that can change in 10 seconds. You don't know what you're reinforcing at that point. That is why immediacy is so important when you deliver reinforcement because the behavior doesn't care. All the behavior is going to respond to is the consequence. And whatever you reinforce is going to change. You've got to remember, close, immediate reinforcement, very, very important. To finish, let's talk about nine guidelines to use reinforcement effectively. And hopefully you're still watching I know we know reinforcement, right? I know you know reinforcement. You don't want to get to test day and panic or get brain fog or freeze up on easy stuff. You just want to know like the back of your hand, right? So let's talk about guidelines for effective reinforcement. One, the initial criterion should be easy to achieve. What does that mean? That means when you're teaching and you're starting to reinforce behavior, that learner should be able to access reinforcement very easily. That's how we're going to get that behavior stronger. That's how we're going to see more of the behavior. Two, reinforcers should be high quality and high in magnitude. Think about what you want to work for. Money, time off. These things are high quality. Don't try to trick your learners or shortchange your learners. They're just like us, right? They, they want high quality stuff. They want to work for high quality stuff. Make sure you're doing your preference and reinforcer assessments. Three, change up your reinforcers. Don't use the same thing every day. Going to lose value. You are going to lose motivation. Four, use response prompts with reinforcement. When you're prompting, reinforce the correct response even when you prompt. 
This is how we're going to start to transfer control of the stimulus, the antecedent stimulus. We want to transfer control from the prompt to our actual stimulus, but first we're going to prompt out that behavior. And when we see that behavior, we want to deliver reinforcement. Five, reinforcement responses should produce direct access to the reinforcer, meaning if reinforcement's available, don't have the learner complete the requirement and then make them wait 20 minutes for reinforcement. Remember the closeness. Adding in response effort to get the reinforcement after they've already done what you asked, huge no-no. I see it all the time. You ask a client to sit down, they sit down, and then before getting the reinforcement, you ask them to do something else. Well, that's it's not right. Direct access to the reinforcer based on your target behavior. Use a continuous schedule, meaning an FR1 to start. Of course, everything is client dependent, but continuous just like the criterion should be easy to achieve. A continuous schedule is the easiest one to achieve and the best place to start typically, especially with the young, early, in development learners. Seven, provide contingent attention, meaning when they do something good, praise them, give them attention, and specific praise. So label what it is you're actually praising. Eight, increase the response reinforcement delay. Eventually, we're going to have to fade out our schedules. And we are going to have to increase the response reinforcement delay because we need to get them acclimated to naturally occurring reinforcers, which brings us to nine. Don't always just contrive everything. You have to try to program in some natural reinforcers eventually. If you watch that and you said, well, I know all that. This is super easy. Well, that's great, right? It's, it's positive and negative reinforcement. It's what you learned first, most likely. But it matters. I can't tell you how many people I talk to after exams or before exams where we get to this stuff and they've neglected it. You can't do that. You've got to know the whole entire task list. And G is the bulk of it. We've got to know this stuff backwards and forward. As always, subscribe if you have not already. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com. When you pass, let us know. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.